Pine Canyon is one of those surprises in the Bay Area, offering a quick trip from city life into nature. Walking in on the stage road, you leave civilization gradually through Castle Rock Regional Recreation Area. The grassy hills to the east are ranch land. After you cross into Diablo Foothills Regional Park, you'll see a spillway and dam built in the 1950s for flood control. The path itself is bumpy sandstone. Starting in 1874, a stage line offered twice daily coaches from Martinez. Ladies in flowered hats and dresses and gentlemen in three-piece suits bounced along for eight miles to a hotel below the Mount Diablo summit called Mountain House. The route's 15 crossings of Pine Creek must have made it a real adventure. As you walk along today, sandstone spires appear in the distance. Beside the trail, you might see California quail foraging in the leaves, an acorn woodpecker tapping on the trunk of a valley oak, a western fence lizard sunning in the brush, a rattlesnake collecting odors from the air, black-tailed deer sharing the road. Pine Canyon is the very definition of a great wildlife corridor, a long linear canyon with water and cover. When you get to the top of Pine Canyon, you cross Southgate Road and there's three different canyons going in different locations. So coming from the east, mountain lions and other wildlife are concentrated into this one canyon on the other side. You're more likely to see a mountain lion on the edge of Walnut Creek than you are in Clayton because they're just following food, water, and deer down the canyon. <laughs> High above this abundant life are the canyon's peregrine falcons. They're called apex predators because while they benefit from many of the plants and animals in the canyon, they're only rarely eaten by anything else. They're small, crow-sized, only two to three pounds, with a wingspan of three feet. Males, called tiercels, are one-third smaller than females, which are simply called falcons. Peregrine speed and agility make them masters of the sky. They can dive at more than 230 miles per hour to seize their prey. Then they either take the food back to a perch or sometimes, amazingly, share it on the wing. Peregrines once thrived on every continent except Antarctica. Here in Pine Canyon, Egg collector's records go back to at least 1883. The Archive of Falconry in Boise, Idaho, has pictures of a group of kids and adults venturing up to a nest here, probably to gather eggs, in 1917. But after World War II, a newly developed pesticide called DDT came into widespread use. Originally aimed at protecting soldiers from malaria and typhus, DDT was later doused on farms and parks, even inside homes, on everything from kitchen cabinets to babies' bassinets. Predatory birds such as osprey, bald eagles, brown pelicans, and peregrine falcons suffered sharp declines. Residues of DDT in their food thinned eggshells so much that parents crushed their own eggs and populations crashed. The U.S. banned most uses of DDT at the end of 1972, but by then peregrine falcons were extinct in the Bay Area. Only two nesting pairs were known in all of California. There were none east of the Mississippi. Starting in 1970, a small group of scientists and falconers on the East Coast launched what they called the largest restoration effort ever attempted for an endangered species. Their success was by no means assured. Only a handful of peregrines had ever been bred in captivity. None had ever been released in the wild. Yet today, the bird is back 
in healthy numbers here and elsewhere. There are 400 pairs in California, likely about the same number as before DDT. In the Bay Area, you can find peregrines nesting in parks, on top of office buildings, and even on the Bell Tower on the UC Berkeley campus. And here in Pine Canyon, among the swirling kettles of turkey vultures and red-tailed hawks, the peregrine once again reigns supreme. We could call it a miracle, or we could look into the hard work and dedicated people and that Falcon, made Falcon, it happen. Falcon. Oh, sure enough, there was Falcon. Falcon right here. See this? Oh. Seth Adams was one of those kids who found wildlife wherever he went. His boyhood career goal was to run a zoo for endangered species. In his late 20s, shortly after having been hired by Save Mount Diablo, Adams heard Brian Walton of the Santa Cruz Predatory Bird Research Group speak at a meeting of the gay and lesbian section of the Sierra Club. Brian Walton was a great speaker, very engaging. At the end, I walked up to him and I said, I work on Mount Diablo, I work with Save Mount Diablo. And I mean, I mean, remember, this is in my first year when Save Mount Diablo's budget was $26,000 and I was part-time 15 hours a week. And you know, the idea of spending this much money on anything was crazy. So I walk up to Brian Walton and I say, so I know there are historic nest sites on Mount Diablo. What would it cost to do a reintroduction there? And he said, $5,000 for a pair of chicks, some volunteers to watch the nest. And on the spot, I said, I can do that. Before telling his board of directors about the conversation, Adams rounded up some allies. One was an infectiously enthusiastic biologist named Gary Beeman. He was this, this strange kind of, of character who made part of his money from working on parts of environmental impact reports, parts of his money by removing rattlesnakes from people's houses, um, and he had all kinds of different pet projects in addition to being a falconer. And I know it was from him that I first knew about the specific historic peregrine falcon sites on Mount Diablo. And when he met the woman that he wanted to marry, one day he, he gave her the backpack, they climbed up the cliffs into the historic peregrine falcon nest site, and when they got there, he pulled out champagne goblets and a bottle of champagne and presented her with a ring. That's how important this place was. It's where he asked his wife to marry him. Restoring peregrines to Pine Canyon was Beeman's lifelong dream. Former Lindsay Museum staffer Diana Granados remembers him coming into her office and saying, You know, just peregrines really in deep shit. <laughs> so I said, okay, we are all aware of it, Gary. And he goes, so I know where they nested and I want to get them back. I want to get them back. That first year, Adams worked on funding, PR, and coordination with all the various players including Lindsay Museum Executive Director Stephen Barbata. Beeman offered contacts in the world of falconry and on-the-ground knowledge. Biologists had devised three different ways to restore peregrines to their old haunts. Chicks could be fostered, added to nests of their own kind, or they could be placed outdoors in an enclosed box and fed by humans until they fledged. That was called hacking. But in the Mount Diablo area, historic peregrine nests had been taken over by prairie falcons. So cross-fostering made the most sense, putting one species into another species' nest. In May of 1989, only six weeks after Beeman had identified a suitable prairie falcon nest, the Predatory Bird Research Group arrived in Pine Canyon with two fluffy white peregrine chicks bred at the San Francisco Zoo. Biologist Lee Allman carried them to a cave in a wooden backpack, took a couple of prairie falcon chicks out of the nest, 
and replaced them with the peregrines. As expected, the foster parents immediately began feeding their new family members. Then Dorothy Brownold took over. Described by the Pleasant Hill Martinez record as a grandmother, peacenik, and bird lover, she moved into a trailer along the stage road and kept tabs on the nest for the next five weeks. In mid-June, the peregrines fledged and flew to parts unknown. In the second year, the Predatory Bird Research Group got some peregrine eggs from a nest under the Bay Bridge. Strange as it sounds, taking peregrine eggs out of one nest and putting them into another was a proven way of increasing the size of the population. They're biologically used to having their eggs predated or, or something happen. If they fail, they will lay a second clutch egg. It's called double clutching. We used to use that as, actually as a tool. After two weeks, we would take the first clutch of eggs and they would lay a second clutch. And that way we were increasing the number of potential young that could be produced in any one year. About two weeks after the Bay Bridge eggs hatched in a Santa Cruz incubator, they were ready for Mount Diablo. Beeman had monitored two sites this year, one in Pine Canyon on the north side of the mountain and another more secluded one on the south side. Photographer Galen Rowell assisted, later documenting the work in a book that he and photographer Michael Sewell published, Bay Area Wild. Biologist Lee Allman has never forgotten the climb into the south side nest that year. I showed up there off another job. You know, you can get worn out doing that stuff. And there's media all over the place. A TV stations and reporters and all this stuff. And I took Dale on the side and he said, can you occupy them? And I sort my climbing gear. We had to do a pretty vertical ascent up there. And we got on the top of it and then we walked along a knife search you know, where it's straight off both sides. And we worked our way down through there, then we looked down in there, about 10 feet, and there's a cave in there. That's where the prairie felt was. And so we managed to get in there. It's kind of an exotic place. I don't think anybody's ever been there before. And then to get out of there, we were pulled off the nose of that, that overhung. You know, where you, you're in space, you don't want to make a mistake. Precise timing was needed to make cross-fostering work. The chicks had to be about the same age as the chicks already in the nest. If they were too young, they couldn't control their body temperature well enough to survive transport. If they were too old, their foster parents might reject them. The magic age seemed to be two to two and a half weeks. Based on when they saw parents start bringing in food, volunteers estimated the age of the chicks already in the nest. It was not an exact science. Almond's successor, Brian Lata, was in for a surprise when he brought two peregrine chicks to a prairie falcon nest on the south side of Mount Diablo in 1991. It was my first time to that site. And so I was a little nervous, and I, when I got to the nest, there weren't chicks, there were eggs. We weren't expecting there to be eggs, but we knew how to deal with it if there were. So we, we had to pull the eggs out and put chicks in, and then hurry out of there. We carried a hot water bottle, but we had to stop the nearest cafe and get that filled up and get it in the box with the eggs. Thanks to Lata and the hot water bottle, those prairie falcon eggs made it to another prairie falcon nest for hatching, and the Tearsel started feeding them immediately. I said they're pretty hardwired. You know, they take their auditory cues and they're like instinctually, okay, this is now my job. Before and after reintroduction days, volunteers did most of the work. One was an energetic young raptor specialist from the Lindsay Museum, Jenny Papka. 
I wasn't gaga about peregrines. I simply thought that this was an important step in the ecology of the Bay Area, and it was a very worthy thing to be involved in. We were assigned different potential nest sites, and our role was to see if we could find the nest, number one. If we could find the nest, then to watch the prairie falcons in their successful hatching of birds, and then report back to Gary and the Santa Cruz Predatory Research Group as to the age of the chicks because they wanted to switch out prairie falcon chicks for peregrine chicks at a certain key age. Papka, who now works with non-releasable captive birds through an organization called Native Bird Connections, said the audacity of bringing a bird back from near extinction didn't faze her at the time. Having Save Mount Diablo, having these other, the museum and all these other organizations buying into it gave us this inkling of, we can really do this. There was absolutely every intention of making this work. And it was a factor of money and coordination and promotion. Lots of moving parts, but it wasn't a lost cause. It was a grand hope and expectation. The project was full of ups and downs. In 1991, two peregrine chicks in Pine Canyon were lost to a predator, probably a great horned owl. Now you have to understand that reintroducing peregrine falcons is a numbers game, and there's a high mortality of chicks, and there's a high mortality uh, with adults, especially inexperienced adults. So the more falcons that we could introduce, the better. Ultimately, we introduced 10 uh, falcons here on Mount Diablo proper in four years, and another 10 were introduced in surrounding regional parks. Hopes rose in 1992 when a pair of adult peregrines was seen flying around in Pine Canyon. But then the female disappeared and was replaced by a female too young to reproduce. Around the same time, Contra Costa Times reported another unfortunate incident. Humans had vandalized a local prairie falcon nest, killing all the chicks. Finally, in 1994, five years after the effort to undo DDT's damage around Mount Diablo had begun, Gary Beeman found two pairs of peregrines nesting on the south side of the mountain. Together, they fledged five young. It was like, okay, this is going to work. This is going to work. We have peregrine falcons on Mount Diablo, and they're going to come back. News around the rest of the country was heartening, too. By the late 1990s, a thousand peregrine chicks had been released into the wild, about a quarter of them in California. By August of 1999, the bird was nesting in so many places, from remote cliffs to urban skyscrapers, that the U.S. Department of the Interior removed it from the endangered species list. That was a national triumph. Around Mount Diablo, people like Seth Adams had stopped worrying about the bird a few years back. After four years, we stopped reintroducing birds and started focusing on how the population was doing throughout the state. The level that we were at before the Peregrine team showed up was, did any chicks fledge this year? <laughs> um, did any chicks survive this year? Did the nest did they did the nest succeed? It was a it was a one bullet point piece of information for fifteen or twenty years. Peregrines had bounced back from the ravages of DDT, but the world around the parks was changing. The East Bay human population was soaring. From two thousand to two thousand and seventeen, in the East Bay parks visitorship went up by 78%. So instead of poison, we have lots of intruders into the areas that peregrines like. Peregrines love cliffs. 
people love cliffs. And peregrines need some privacy. A broad coalition of people, including leaders in the climbing community, clamored for closure of the rocks around Pine Canyon during the nesting season. Park officials hesitated because they didn't have money for enforcement. But finally, in February 2015, they went ahead anyway. That's when Stacy Hobbit stepped up. About six years ago, I was walking along this trail and I fell in with Bridget Calvi, who was then the supervisor of this park. She told me that, that she helped establish a nesting closure zone here just a few weeks before with the other parks around the area so that we have a joint closure zone. And I said something like, that's wonderful, but how are you going to police it? And she said, well, that's the problem. And being a volunteer in Mount Diablo State Park, I said, well, we think we can help you. So Hoppet and a handful of other volunteers formed a group called the Peregrine Patrol. We kind of envisioned our role as cops because we were focused so much on policing the trespasser zone, but it's not appropriate at all because we're just volunteers. We don't have any real authority. And we realized that kind of gradually over the years that we were really a natural history team trying to convert people from trespassers into peregrine watchers. With strong support from regional and state park staff, the group flourished, growing from five founders in 2015 to 60 members in 2020. To better reflect its educational role, it eventually changed its name to the Peregrine Team. So every year, we follow the, the birds from the two parents meeting, courting, house hunting, establishing their household, laying eggs, sitting on the eggs, hatching, which is a great big time, all the feeding of the birds, which is the babies, which is the most active period, and then, probably most exciting and stressful, is watching those babies take their first flight. They essentially fall forward out of the nest, having never flown before, and it's an 800-foot drop. It's pretty remarkable. One of the team's earlier members was Rosita Harvey, a leader in the Mount Diablo Audubon Society. She and her husband have been birding here for more than 30 years, and Rosita still hikes in the canyon almost every day. I like yeah. the exercise. I come for yes. the exercise. I come for the view. I come to be in the country. I'm from Chile, from the country, and this is the closest that I can be to the country. When her mother was dying in Chile, Harvey made frequent calls to her from this canyon. As the years rolled on, she began to make videos of the birds she observed here. At first, she did it for her friend Jean Richmond, a Mount Diablo Audubon Society leader, who at the time was too ill to leave her home. I will videotape everything that I saw, especially when the falcons were mating, and then the babies, and then feeding. She taught me a lot. She would pick up sounds in the background that I didn't know were there, because she was so keen at hearing everything, and she couldn't go out birding. So that provided a great enjoyment for myself and for her as well. In 2019, retired banker Wally DeYoung joined the team. He didn't know much about birds, but he enjoyed learning from people who did. There's a real team spirit, a real camaraderie uh, with the other team members that also just makes you feel like part of a family. He brought along a new high-powered camera. At first, it was tough to get the shots he wanted of, as he put it, a feathered missile flying 237 miles an hour. But sometimes he had the opposite problem. He and his camera were all set, 
but nothing was happening for hours at a time. As Peregrine expert Tom Cade wrote, Although it can be a demon of action in the air, the peregrine actually leads a rather phlegmatic existence, spending much of its time perched and calmly surveying its world. De Young began spending hours in the canyon every week. We had a lot of activity in the nest last year in March and then certainly into April where it was obvious that they were incubating. Most of the incubation, the sitting on the eggs, is done by the female, with the male taking the lion's share of the responsibility for bringing food. By the end of April, we first got to see our fuzzy little bobbleheads appearing in the scrape site, and got to see a mom and dad supplying fresh meat to the babies, whose appetites are absolutely voracious. Rosita Harvey was making videos in 2019, too. She and team member Susanna de Trapaga recorded what had to be a chilling sight. One of the bobbleheads tumbled out of the scrape and died. It, it really hit everyone hard, and that sounds strange, especially when you know that this group knows full well that the mortality rate among peregrines, as with many raptors, is 60 to 80 percent. After the first chick fell, three hatchlings were left. Then another chick stopped eating, and a third died of unknown causes, leaving only one bird to fledge. Hobbit and de Young think some of these problems were linked to the nesting pair's inexperienced male. We had a new dad last year, and he was kind of a klutz. The video of the two of them is hilarious, where he'll bring in a, a fresh bird and begin to clumsily feed it to the Iases, the chicks. And she flies in, which immediately makes him back off and drop the bird. He flies out because he's terrified at this point. And then she flies out with the bird. And the chicks get no food. The Peregrine team's 2020 season started in early February. On the first training day, Wally DeYoung offered tips on how to spot perched peregrines on far-off cliffs. With their light breasts and dark wings, they looked a bit like miniature penguins. Peregrines love the peak. So we look at the very top, and then we look in the caves that are common to them. They have their favorites. Everybody got them? Can you, can you see? Oh. That is so cool. By mid-March, hillsides were greening. Wildflowers splashed color across the forest floor. Everything from bobcats to digger bees was on the prowl. Birds and frogs and crickets were singing. It was an exhilarating time to be in the canyon. But the human situation had grown complicated. Bay Area health officials had ordered people to stay at home to avoid spreading COVID-19, a disease that had become a global pandemic. They could still walk in parks, though, and many of them did. We now have a shelter in place because of the COVID virus, and people need to get out. They're tired of being cooped up at home. I can't tell you how many people I've talked to, they said, oh my gosh, I never knew this park was here. This is my first time here. In so. one two-hour period on a holiday weekend, more than 20 trespassers were spotted inside the closure zone. A few times, the team saw unmanned aerial vehicles or drones circling among the pinnacles. Team members cordoned off the closure zone with bright yellow hazard tape. They chatted with visitors to make sure they understood the rules. By April, members were collectively putting in about 16 hours a day, a new team record. The bird situation was complicated, too. A new pair took over a long-established nesting cavity. The female falcon who had been there last year flapped in late, without a partner. 
days of aerial combat ensued. Team member and retired biologist Joan Duffield said the first female to arrive appeared undaunted. She stood her ground and she won. And the other one just hung out about half a mile down from the canyon. You could, you could hear her all over. She was wailing, 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 wailing. Videographer and team member Kendall Uwe recorded the next chapter. It was almost nonstop aerial battle for about two hours. And at two points, I was absolutely positive that I saw four peregrine falcons in the air. I have a video of one peregrine falcon passing two others and then looping around and then coming back and passing a fourth bird that was sitting in a cave. So we definitely know that we've got two pairs now. The 2019 female started forming a bond with the newly arrived male. It's very cool to see it happening and to think that the population is so strong. We actually have two pairs in, in proximity to each other. Whereas if we didn't have a strong population, you know, they'd probably, they'd be very far apart. By mid-May 2020, Rosita Harvey was discouraged. Less than 20 miles away, peregrines at UC Berkeley had already produced chicks that were sprouting flight feathers, while peregrines here in Pine Canyon were still mating. They may have laid some eggs, but they hadn't started taking turns sitting on them, a process called hard incubation. It is May. Pair one copulated again. They copulated the last time I was here. They keep copulating based on the reports. And where are the babies? Half a mile up the canyon, Joan Duffield hoped that she'd find the second pair in incubation. But after watching for a while, she was discouraged too. They've been out of the nest for just under two hours. And it's May 14th. We've actually looked at some studies in California, and the last known hard incubation date was May 7th. And it's never been that late here. But then again, we've never had two pairs, so you don't know what's going on. By mid-June, the 2020 season's outcome was clear. We now know that we're not gonna get any chicks this year. Turns out, that more is less, at least in this context. We don't know for sure why we don't have babies. We certainly have a lot of sex going on, but here's what we think. There is so much tension between the two pairs, there's usually only one here, that they distracted one another from their core job of laying eggs and raising chicks. East Bay Regional Park District volunteer Mary Malik had been monitoring peregrine falcons around San Francisco for many years. Her notes indicated that Pine Canyon had fledged peregrine chicks in only seven of the last 13 years. So this year's barren nests were not unusual. But having two pairs of falcons in the canyon was. So that alone is historic. Does that mean they'll be back next year? We don't know. But it's been like an addictive mystery comedy murder western series with all sorts of gunfights and reunions and disappearances as the intimate lives of these critters show up on the screen of the cliff in front of our eyes. Back in Santa Cruz, the Predatory Bird Research Group was no longer hatching peregrine eggs in captivity and planting chicks in the wild. Since 1992, it had been monitoring the status of peregrines across a broad swath of Northern California. Over the years, the news grew increasingly good. Peregrines were being found in new nest sites every year, some in completely new territories. But researchers weren't worry-free. They are exposed at sublethal levels in many contaminants. 
peregrines at times present with rodenticide poisoning. They do sometimes eat rodents. And then of course there's the looming threat of climate change and how that might impact prey populations. In recent years, the research group hadn't been in close touch with the Peregrine team. That changed in 2019, when the group's new director, Zika Glucks, had a chance encounter with a team member in Pine Canyon. That led to the research group getting a permit to band Peregrines and do other research in the park. We rely on volunteers to be able to do our work. And so since they already had a very well-developed crew of people, that were out there and had some good experience telling the birds apart, recording their behaviors. It wasn't gonna take much to make sure that we knew where to access the young and at what time. So now Pine Canyon has come full circle. Local volunteers and scientists from Santa Cruz have again joined forces to protect this place. And members of the Peregrine team are officially citizen scientists. Everybody has a different focus. And together we seem to know everything, you know, or we can try to figure it out. And figuring it out is so much fun. There's so much bad news everywhere you look. And here we have a happy story to tell. Humanity intervened in a really bad way back in the 1940s with DDT. But in the case of Pine Canyon, and other places around the globe, they went back in and they restored a species that had almost disappeared. So we can do the right thing. We're back here sharing the joy of all of the things that make us happy about being back here. Some visitors walked by the group up on the hill and said, you know, those people have nothing better to do than look at those birds. And we looked at each other and said, yeah, isn't that great? I'm already excited about next season. What will happen next, next year? Will they settle down? Will they be more comfortable with each other? Will they have already shopped for the right place to have their nest for next year? And will we have chicks and maybe two pair? How amazing would that be?